morning, everyone. My name is Ajit Narayanan, and um, I lead a number of different teams here at Google um, that work on solutions for people with disabilities. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be talking to you today. Um, I used to be, before I joined Google, I used to be the founder and the CEO of a company that was also based in the IIT Madras Research Park um, called Avaaz. And we did a lot of pioneering work in augmentative and alternative communication. Um, now, at Google, um, many of the projects that I lead use machine learning and AI to advance what we can do in the area of assistive technology. And in my talk today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of these projects and to tell you a little bit about how Google thinks about assistive technology and what we can do um, differently in space with some of the emerging trends that we're seeing in the space. So without further ado, um, Google, one of Google's um, strategic imperatives as we think about assistive technology is how can we leverage the strength of some of our platforms. Uh, if you look at platforms like Android, Chrome, the Play Store, these are platforms that reach really billions of individuals around the world. Uh, you know, and in order to be able to use these platforms for social good, in order to be able to use these to empower people that have been traditionally underserved, um, that's very central to Google's principles and Google's philosophy. At the same time, there's also a lot of good that can be done by leveraging these platforms as opposed to standalone solutions. Because of the reach that these platforms have, solutions that are built on top of these platforms by Google and by other you know, third-party um, companies can instantly reach many of these users with platforms that are well-trusted and well-tested. So the work that my team, my teams do are primarily in these areas. We do try to use Android and Chrome in order to be able to create assistive technology experiences um, that millions of people around the world can benefit from. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about three assistive technologies that were built um, at Google. Um, there are several others, accessibility features, accessibility related features, uh, mainstream features that benefit people with disabilities greatly. But I'm going to spend some time today talking about these three. And I think uh, these provide a really interesting um, overview of the assistive technology investments that Google have made coming from three different directions. Action Blocks, which is an Android app um, for people with cognitive disabilities. And cognitive disabilities can include conditions like Down syndrome or autism, but also AIDS-related conditions uh, like dementia. Lookout, which is an app, again on Android, that um, helps people who are blind or who have low vision uh, make sense of the world around them. And Project Activate, which is an app that helps people with very severe motor disabilities to communicate. So these are three assistive technologies that cover a wide range of disabilities. And uh, in the process of talking about all of these technologies, I will talk about how Google's strengths in machine learning and artificial intelligence have helped us to build these technologies um, and also some of the principles that we use to make sure that these technologies are built responsibly and effectively. Uh, let's start with action blocks. The overview of the value proposition of action blocks is essentially to be able to complete daily tasks with one tap. Now, um, let's suppose that a person who's using their phone has a desire to do a particular thing, for example, if they want to listen to their favorite song on their phone. Um, this slide that I'm showing you now shows the multiple steps that are involved in actually doing this. So first, you would have to open your phone and find the music app. In this particular case, it's Spotify. Um, you would then have to find the search button and the the button is hidden in a very complex user interface that has many, many different elements in it. You would type the name of the artist in the search, and then you might press the play button in the UI 
in each of these involves understanding the, the design patterns of how apps are created. There's a lot of encoded knowledge that's easy for people who have technology literacy to be able to access, but can, can pose a significant accessibility barrier for whom these technologies are unfamiliar or who have difficulties with remembering and learning new things. For example, people who have age-related conditions like dementia. So what Action Blocks does is that it allows you to place widgets on your home screen. So these are essentially large um, customizable blocks that you can place right on the home screen of your app, which perform the action in a single step. So you might have a button that says, you know, play this particular song or play the songs by this particular band. And it's right there on the home screen. And you can customize it. You can add you know, your own custom image to it uh, to help with familiarity. And the way that it works is that it uses the Google Assistant to then invoke a command which performs the action end to end. Now, behind the scenes here, there are many, many different machine learning technologies that are being used. Um, the Assistant has a very sophisticated natural language understanding pipeline that allows for converting natural language commands like play Beatles on Spotify, converting that into internal representation um, that allows it to then trigger various actions. Those actions themselves are also, um, this, a database of these actions is created, curated, and maintained with a significant amount of machine learning um, and representational knowledge. So the end-to-end -end result of using action blocks is essentially shown on this slide um, as, as a brief video. So you can see that the user taps the button and then it invokes the assistant and then it goes straight into the app that the user was expecting and it starts playing right away. So it's a single tap that replaces a multi-step operation and acts as an accessibility, um, an, an accessibility feature uh, that makes these complex user journeys more accessible for people with cognitive disabilities. Um, let's talk about uh, some of the other accessibility considerations when behind action blocks. So it does support a variety of accessible of assistive technologies like physical switches, it provides icons that are familiar to AAC users, and it also can act as a, as, as a basic AAC app. So anyone that has an Android phone can have access to a baseline AAC app um, for free. So these are some of the benefits of action blocks. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Lookout. Now, Lookout is a, is a great example of machine vision and um, vision-based machine learning that's applied, applied to assistive technology. And um, it started off in 2019, the first version was released, and um, we've continuously improved it, we've continuously added features to it based on user feedback. And I think the evolution of Lookout is a really interesting example of how Google approaches um, some of these machine learning based assistive technologies through the lens of users and how we, we center our processes on, on the user as well. So let me give you a walkthrough of the app, um, but let me also call out some of the ways in which we have made this app really in collaboration with people with disabilities um, throughout the lifetime of the app. So we started Lookout a, a few years ago. The first version of Lookout really had three different modes in it. Uh, it had what was called an explore mode. So essentially, what the explore mode do, does, um, or what the explore mode did in the first 1.0, was that it would look, uh, you know, the, the phone has a camera, and Lookout, the Lookout app would look through the camera around in the world around them. And um, it would then use a combination of machine learning and natural language processing to convert what it was seen through the lens into a narration that described what it was seeing. So in some sense, it was acting as um, an assistive technology that uh, described the world around them for a person who was blind or with low vision. Um, and the goal being that this, this would therefore be an assistive technology in helping users find things, navigate things, recognize things, and so on. Um, so one of the uh, other features that Lookout 1.0 had was uh, shopping. So you know, there was a mode where you could 
uh, you could get help when you were looking for different things, and also had a quick read mode in order to read documents. Now, one of the main assumptions of Lookout 1.0 was this idea of a hands-free operation. So there's a, an image on this on this slide which shows someone wearing a, a, an Android phone with a lanyard on their neck with the camera facing outwards. And um, Lookout 1.0 was actually triggered by touch. So if you, if you covered and uncovered the, the lens, then the app would recognize the change in brightness and that would actually start Lookout. You could interact with Lookout with tap, uh, with with knocking on the back of your phone. So you create a wrist, you create a fist with your uh, with your hand, and then you're able to tap the back of the phone to be able to perform various actions like pausing or switching modes. And it also had a fingerprint sensor control. And the common theme here was that the idea was you wouldn't have to look at the the phone at all. In fact, if if it was being used by a, an individual who had a visual impairment. Um, this might be a more comfortable, there was an assumption that this might be a more comfortable way of interacting with the device. So, when we released 1.0, um, we did release it after a significant amount of testing, but we found some, some challenges with it. We found that there were issues in framing. So, when you had a uh, hands-free experience, uh, it couldn't always guarantee that what the camera was seeing was something that uh, had all of the information content that would allow for it to be um, described effectively to the user, and there were also challenges with recognition accuracy as a result. And so, working very closely with users, we had to pivot away from this hands-free mode of operation, and we also had to refine um, some of the other features that we had. So, instead of a general shopping app that was based on barcodes, um, you know, it was really hard for users to center the camera on a barcode. Instead, we made we made it a food labeling app. So we restricted the domain, but we chose the domain that we heard most users were interested in. We also created a document reading mode. And in this document reading mode, not only does it read a document out, but the app also helps you to frame the document by giving you instructions on how you can move your camera so that the entire document is in the frame. So this was a you know, this was an example of where we actually remove functionality in order to make the app more useful for very specific use cases. And it turned out to be really well received by users. Um, in Lookout 3.0, we went one step further. Um, we had made an assumption in the earlier versions of Lookout that the input to Lookout was always going to be a video stream. Lookout 3.0 was where we acknowledged that in many cases, the input might be just a still image. So this could be something that you know a user is sent uh, by message, for example. It could be a photo that the user took. And we added capabilities to be able to describe uh, what's in this image, both by reading the text in it as well as describing people. For example, saying that this is someone who's, who's this tall and wearing this sort of a, a, a clothing or, or something like that. Um, so the really interesting thing about Lookout is that while the machine learning features are really impressive. The magic really came from iterating on the application uh, with a combination of this machine learning approach and with a very user-centered uh, design and the ability to really stay the course um, in the case of Google and over the years invest in making this, this product more and more applicable, uh, really pioneering a category that very few other apps existed. Um, I'm now going to move to the, the last product uh, that I want to present to you today, which is called Project Activate. And Project Activate um, really handles a very different use case. And this use case is if you can't speak, and you can't move your hands, and you can't move other parts of your body very well, uh, do you have a way to communicate? So you can't communicate verbally, but you can't also communicate with sign language, you can't write. Um, so what, what what is the best way that you can be empowered to communicate with other people? And this is a problem that affects millions of people with conditions like ALS, multiple sclerosis, cerebral palsy, and, and several, several others. Um, when we surveyed users, we found that users wanted a solution that was portable because they didn't want to use the system uh, regardless of where they were and you know, across a variety of life environments. They wanted something that was cheap, ideally even free. And they also wanted something that didn't depend on expensive peripherals like ICS systems or um, you know, very expensive switches and things like that. So something that was self-contained. And the 
insights that we had was that we could use face gestures in order to be able to help users express themselves and to do things. So the way that this works is that um, the front-facing camera on, on, on your Android phone and looks at your face, and then it's able to recognize actions, very, very sensitive actions, right? Actions like smiling, uh, you know, very subtle things like opening your mouth, raising your eyebrows, looking up or looking left or looking right. And it can then be configured so that each of those actions, uh, which are recognized through vision, then trigger a particular action like you know, saying a phrase out loud, playing an audio, sending a message, dialing a number. So um, you're able to convert these facial gestures into things that your phone is able to do for you. Um, how does it detect facial movements? So there is a front-facing camera and a pretty state-of-the-art machine learning pipeline that's able to uh, convert um, the image that is captured from the front camera into signals that allow you to detect each of these different facial gestures. The interesting thing about um, about Project Activate, and this was true for Lookout as well, is that all of the machine learning actually happens on device. So it preserves privacy. It doesn't send the data outside of your device. And it doesn't require any user training either. It's not that the user has to be trained in this particular case to make a very specialized gesture. Everyone knows how to smile. Um, and that's what the app is based on. And um, it's also possible for users to customize these these different gestures because each, each person is different. So based on lighting, based on facial paralysis, based on you know whether there is a chance of uh, false activations, users can customize the sensitivity and the timing of any of these actions as well. So this uh, slide shows a brief video of how um, um, Project Activate works. So uh, I'll talk through it for people that have uh, accessibility needs. So what it's showing here is that you know the, there's a camera and it's looking at the user and it's detecting different facial gestures. For example, it's detecting, um, you know, uh, it's, it's providing options to the user to do different things if the user opens their mouth or if they look right or if they smile and then the user is opening their mouth and there's a confirmation step and this confirmation step, uh, once the user performs it, uh, by opening their mouth again, it sends an SMS to a particular number asking for someone to come. come. So this is a really powerful feature, right? and it, it totally changed the life of many people who otherwise had very limited ways of communicating. And it, uh, it, it gave people a lot of independence. Uh, it gave people uh, a lot of empowerment to be able to do things. Um, and this was because of the fact that it was based on Android and it was on device and um, it was a free app. All of these are free. Uh, what it meant is that it, it made it commercially accessible to nearly anyone that, that, that can afford an Android phone, which is uh, billions of people at this point in time. So that's really the message I want to leave you with. Machine learning is revolutionizing assistive technology, and you know we're fortunate that Google to be doing some really important and interesting work in this area. The success in this space is really predicated, I think, on, on two things, which I've called out on this slide. The first is to center on users. It's very easy to get carried away by the technology. And often, the best products that you build in this space come from cutting down features, not from adding features, and refining them to the point where the utility is, is absolutely clear, and users are able to get an incredible boost in their productivity and in their activities are really tight. And that takes time. It's it's not it's not something that's easy to get right on the first attempt. And to have the stamina to stay the course, to make those incremental changes, to keep up with the technology and to keep improving, that's the that's the secret of, of success in this case. And uh, we're very fortunate in Google to have some examples for that. So with that, um, I wish you all a, a very happy conference and. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have spoken to all of you. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of your conference. Goodbye.